but the upshot of all of this is my relationship with Brian changed over a studio argument which I have quoted before so I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying so we start so I mentioned Brian was in very very good condition yes. fit yes. but he hadn't been in the studio for a very long time and also it's all very well singing once but the demands of the record producer are often great and it often requires multiple takes and multiple performances and we were working on one particular song and the first take was not bad but it wasn't great second take was better third take was worse than the first take and I thought oh dear we've reached that point where those that are really used to working in the studio every day can sing for 10 hours Brian had sung for 45 minutes and it was already you know he just didn't have the chops he you know he was tired so I said I think we should stop it's not working it's really not working and and the thing about the Beach Boys was there was a lot of yes men around and I was you know I had the hubris of youth I also had the number one album and single and I thought you know what I'm gonna say what I think I've always been very honest and Brian said to me what do you think of that take Steve I said honestly I don't think it's very good and you could hear <gasps> in the control room everyone deep breath taking in oh dear shall I pack my bags now and Brian stormed out the studio so I looked around and I thought okay that's it but what can I do my name's going on this record yeah, and I've just got a great record I can't have a record that's shit yeah. you know and no one needs to see or hear that by the way you know the the Brian Wilson or the Beach Boys thing is so good so the studio was like it was you know so I carried on with a few bits and pieces that I had to do a bit of housekeeping you know tidying up a few tracks next day phone rings so this was also towards the end of the day so we th I said guys why don't we just go and have dinner let you know call it a day so we did next day Tom Hewlett phones me who's the manager he goes Brian's not coming in the studio today I went okay he said do you know where he is I said no he said I'm going to tell you he's gone for some singing lessons with a vocal coach thank you I put the phone down <laughs> he just needed someone to tell him that no one else had told him yeah. and from that point on it started to change my relationship and the only other time it changed I won't say the circumstances because a bit that we had another studio fight not with Brian but but I was really upset by something that someone had done and I sat out so, so the, in American studios particularly in Los Angeles the studio backs onto an alleyway where you park the cars the classic Starsky and Hutch alleyways you know that you drive down and that was the back of Westlake Audio and I'd really had enough by then. I was just at the end of my tether. This was still quite early on in the, in the sessions. I thought, what, am I, what have I let myself in for, you know? And I was sat at the back of the thing. I was really upset, like a combination of cross, angry, frustrated. And Brian turned up. And the way that it used to work was that Brian would drive his car in. And he had like a, and I mean this, a Pinto. Those that don't know, Pinto was like a really cheap kind of car. I don't know what, it's like a Ford Fiesta or something. But he would be followed by um, one of Landy's helpers, just to make sure everything was okay. It wasn't like security, it was just, you know, to me. But for some reason, Carlos, who was the particular driver, got lost in traffic or held up in traffic. So Brian got there on his own, opened the door, parked his car and said, what's the matter with you? I said, I've had it. I've really, really had it. And he sat down next to me and he put his arm around me and he said, I know what you mean. They used to do that to me all the time. Hmm. And I went, whoa! And from that moment on, our relationship changed. Because I thought, they put you through that same shit that they're putting through. It's, be it's the way they are. Yeah. And, and it was the most incredible thing. And many, many years later, I'll always remember this, we were working, we were, it was the um, live thing they were doing at Kenwood. You know, they used to, the Beach Boys used yes, to do these things yeah. at Kenwood. So when you're in Kenwood once you've done the sound check you're kind of trapped because the house is quite a way away and that's where the food is and so they go on bo uh, little golf carts to the to the thing so all the band went off to go and have some food and Brian said I don't want I just have there was, there was like a tiny table with a couple of sandwiches and some crisps on and he said I don't, I don't want anything I'll just stay here so I do have a picture of this so there's a pair of us sat there in deck chairs it was a really beautiful day 
sat there and he was just ch chatting to me about all sorts of stuff. And I remember exactly when it was. It was the weekend of Glastonbury. And he said to me, where are your girls? I said, they're at Glastonbury. He said, give me a phone. Let's phone them and freak them out. You know, sadly, we couldn't get a signal, which was really annoying because he was going to phone them and go, hey, you know. Um, and then we do the first part of the show. There's like the first part, and then there's a, a, uh, an interval because it's like picnic and sandwich and everything at, at Kenwood. And again, he came up to me and he said, um, can you stand by the side of the stage and watch? And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to come up to you afterwards, he said, and I want you to tell me about the vocal. I said, what do you mean? He said, tell, tell me if it's any good or not. I said, why? He said, and then he held my hand, he said, because everyone always says it's great, and you know it's not always great. Yeah. That, you know, they're the private stories, but I, I want to tell you those because I want people to understand what a heart he has. Yes. Do you know what I mean? And that doesn't always come across. Well, it, People have a view of him that's often very different. But he doesn't suffer fools gladly, and I think that's the problem. There's this shell, and then you're either in the circle or not. And I think people generally, not always, but generally appreciate honesty. Mm, mm. And a creative person needs honesty. Mm. Otherwise, they just go off on a tangent yeah. or turn the name. Because Brian has a couple of dear friends that I've met a few times that are not in the music industry at all. That I've seen them with him, and you see the way he talks with them and is with them. That they're normally wealthy individuals that don't want anything. Because the thing is, with a lot of those people, and I've seen it with I'm sound like a terrible name drop. I've seen it with Paul McCartney as well. Most people, when they're around, them, want something off these people. Yes. From a picture or an autograph to yeah, whatever. Yeah. So Brian is surrounded by people that want something from him. Yeah. And when he's with his friends that don't want anything from him, that's incredibly brilliant. Yeah. You know. And it's anyway, it's I, I'm so pleased and proud that I did that record. Sadly it wasn't the huge seller that it should have been, but it formed a great relationship. My relationship with all of them is good. My relationship with Brian and particularly Carl was fabulous. My relationship, of course, with Bruce is, is as it as it is. Yeah. Um, and I saw all of them very recently when they played in Liverpool. And um, you know, it's we've got baggage, but it's fun. Yeah. 